I will introduce our next speaker, my good friend and someone who has been with the McGovern Institute from the very founding of the Institute, Jerry Fishbach, who served on the McGovern Board of Directors from the very earliest days, helping guide the creation of this Institute, the running of this Institute. I've even heard through back channels that Jerry was important in getting me here to the McGovern Institute. Jerry, uh, I have to, uh, and, he's, and one of the reasons he's a friend is not only because he's been on our board, but we overlapped at the NIH. I was a scientific director in the, in, in the National Institute of Mental Health when Jerry was the director of the Neurology Institute. Of course, you know, you, you're in the government for a long time. You get used to everybody in a position of power is Dr. No, right? Whatever you want to do. No, can't do that. What, can't, what, did you do that? No, can't do that. Do, Jerry was Dr. Yes. Jerry came in, and whatever we said, said, you know, we need a new way of doing science here. Yes, let's do it. We, Jerry said, we, why are we working in these old, decrepit buildings? Let's get this changed. No, Jerry, you can't do that. No, and Jerry would always, Jerry would get it done. Jerry, and he didn't just do this at the NIH, he did this every place he went throughout his career. He, um, sorry, you, so you, can, you, can do, you can disconnect that. He was, at, he was at Harvard Neurobiology, he was at Washington University, uh, and now he's, done, he's doing the same thing at the F Simons Foundation. It's just really incredible what he has done with the Simons Foundation and their autism initiative to put together just a spectacular research program in an area where people might have thought that that kind of progress just could not be made in such a short period of time. Um, I have lots of other detailed notes on uh, Jerry's career, but I think I will actually not delay him any further, uh, we, uh, please give a warm welcome to Jerry Fishbach. Thanks very, very much, Bob, for both the invitation and that introduction. And I want to add my great appreciation to Pat and Laurie, and also to Phil Sharp, who I, th I, th I saw walk in earlier, the founding director of the Institute, who uh, had the courage to switch fields for a period of time, actually not leaving his old field, but paying tremendous attention to the needs of the McGovern Institute and what it meant for MIT. But Pat and Laura, you must be very, very proud today. I've worked with many people who founded institutes, but very few who became as involved, who really wanted to know about the science, who got involved in a, in a very detailed way without being invasive or controlling. It ain't easy dealing with complex institutions, but I think you've been role models in seeing this through and bringing it this far, so it's a pleasure to be here with you. How many of you in the audience have interacted directly with an individual who is autistic, either child or adult? Yeah, it's, it's a, a high percentage, and it's quite remarkable. Uh, it's now estimated. The reason this talk is timely at this institute is that the prevalence is estimated, using expanded definitions to be sure, to be close to 1% of the American population. Almost one in 100 individuals are on the autism spectrum, at least as defined by current criteria. And it's worth remembering when this disorder was defined in 1943 by uh, 
Leo, Leo Kanner, that was considered a rare disorder. It wasn't heard of. Edwin Schrodinger, his friend, said that Kanner had seen what other people had seen, but thought what no one else had thought. He described in 1943 11 children who previously were known, and their group was previously known, as feeble-minded, moronic, schizoid, retarded, idiotic. No one quite knew what to call these people, but he recognized at that time in 1943, he was dealing with a distinct entity. And I want to emphasize that because the distinctions blur at the margins and people tend to forget that there is a core that is unique to autism. So listen to Kanner's words when he saw uh, a group of people. He saw one boy in particular who, by the way, has just been written up again in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. He's now 77 years old. If you have a chance, find that article. His name in the article, it was, he was known as Donald T. And he knew right away he was not like any other five-year-old boy. He knew from the moment he read the 33-page letter from his father. Kind of gave kind of the idea this may run in families. 33-page letter that described the boy in obsessive detail as happiest when he was alone, oblivious to detail, drawing into a shell and living within himself, oblivious to everything around him. Donald had a mania for spinning toys. He liked to shake his head from side to side and spin himself around in circles. And he had terrible temper tantrums when his routine was disrupted. And then when Kanner finally met Donald, when his father brought him over from Pennsylvania to Johns Hopkins, his suspicions were confirmed. In addition to the symptoms the letter described, Kanner noted Donald's explosive, seemingly irrelevant use of words. Donald referred to himself in the third person, repeated words and phrases spoken to him, and communicated his own desires by attributing them to others. So this is the picture that Kanner saw, and it's the picture that's true today. It's expanded on the margins. The APA, the American Psychiatric Association, has expanded the definition with each issue of its manual of psychiatric disorders. So the incidence has grown from one to 1,000, maybe 15 years ago, to one in 100 today. I believe it's more awareness and recognition of the disorder. I do not believe we're in the midst of an epidemic. I believe that this, was, this incidence was probably true uh, many years ago, but people ignored these children. The, uh, I've summarized this, the phenomenon as aloneness and sameness. And the next issue of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association will talk about autism spectrum disorders, focusing on these social interactions, but with dashes, autism spectrum disorder with epilepsy, autism spectrum disorder with intellectual disability, and I want to come back and talk about that later, autism spectrum disorder with a number of other things, language disorder. But there is a core, and it's this social cognition. In some ways, and if you can imagine what it must be life to go th like to go through life without understanding what the people you are with are thinking. You have no way of gauging whether they're angry or sad or happy. The compensations you must undergo to really live in that environment. People have called this a lack of a theory of mind. And it's, it's quite debilitating. Now, the other reason for being invited to speak, not the prevalence and the urgency of the problem, but as Bob implied, it's really the remarkable progress that has been made in the last 10 years, parallel with the McGovern. I think most of it's been made in the last five years. And if uh, some of the slides I will show you refer to work since 2008. And a lot of it has been done within 10 miles of this building. And I think a significant amount, as Bob illustrated, was either stimulated or is being followed up in the McGovern Institute. 
So I like to think about approaches to uh, autism at several levels, and Bob ran through this as well. At, at the genetic level and understanding the molecular, cellular biology of these genetic risk factors, how are these genes working in the nervous system? And then also at the level, the payoff level, the really important level, is understanding what they are doing to neural circuits in the brain and to cognition and behavior. Probably the most difficult of all levels to study. I don't know if you can see this. I, I, this lighting is difficult in the room, but when one, when one wants, can I go backwards here? No. Yeah, when one wants to study genetics, there are many, many different approaches. So you have to place your bets. What we did at the Simons Foundation was bet on a certain type of genetic change called a copy number variant. And it turns out that all of us in our genomes don't have exactly two genes, one from our mothers, one from our fathers. There are some variants, and these variants arise during the maturation of germ cells, sperm and eggs. Sometimes you don't inherit two genes. You only get one. Sometimes you don't inherit two genes. You get three or four because the, the, these genes have been copied during the formation of the germ cells. Now, some of these deletions are innocuous. They just make us different from one another. Why I'm different from Bob, a little more handsome, I think, <laughs> mature at least. But why you're all different is, is this enormous and it's become evident since 2004 that there is enormous difference in the copy number that you have in your genome and how you're different from your neighbor, how you're different from your parents. You're not exact copies of them. Now here's an example of one that's particularly important in autism. And this is a bit of science, so I will try and walk you through it. If you march from left to right on this curve, the investigation is, in, is trying to test how many copies of the DNA in this region from left to right do two individuals have. And on the average, they have two when compared with the normal population. But one individual here has only one copy. As you can see, that falls below the baseline. And one individual has three copies. This work was done by Lauren Weiss uh, and, by, and people at Children's Hospital in Boston and at the Broad Institute with the MIT connection. And this particular copy number variant is not neutral. 40%, 40 to 50% of individuals with this variation, usually it's the deletion, 40% of individuals with that deletion will be autistic. So this is what's called a highly penetrant genetic variation. It's not quite as penetrant as sickle cell anemia, but it's much more penetrant than many other disorders where the gene adds a small increment to the risk. This is a big risk factor. And this particular deletion has turned out to be one of the most common uh, that have been uncovered to date. None of the deletions are, are more than 1% of the autistic population. But the clues from the very first studies that have been conducted are that there may be many of them. There may be a hundred such deletions, which are real autism risk factors. They're not neutral. And our job is to find them and identify them. So individually rare, altogether perhaps common, and highly penetrant. So we feel that in the last three years, we and many other people around the world are onto something by looking at these copy number variants. Now, it's going to be difficult to know which gene in this segment. There are about 29 in this particular deletion is the, is the one at fault. And then it will really be tough to know what that gene is doing in the developing nervous system and when does it act. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time here to give you a taste of the genetics. So based on this finding, the Simons Foundation, where I am now the scientific director of the Autism Initiative, 
uh, decided to collect many families in of the simplex structure, that is where there's one child with autism, but neither parent and none of the siblings are affected. This is called a simplex structure. And the reason this is of an advantage in searching for responsible genes is that you have a comparison in the same family. If you found a deletion in a proband in a child with autism, but did not find it in the parents or in the siblings, you'd be pretty sure that this was a causal factor. It's much better than doing that in a whole population of case control studies where you're never quite sure who the comparison is. So we set out early on to collect um, 2,000 families of that structure, simplex families. This is from a paper which is going to appear in about a week in the journal Neuron uh, describing how this collection was assembled. And I'm sure you won't be able to see the next slide, but uh, we're quite proud of the fact that, can you see that? You can? Okay, well, I, I'm red, green, colorblind, so I, I know it's up there, but. Uh, you, this is charting the number of families per quarter of the year. And in two years, we've passed 2,000 families. These families were collected at 13 university clinics around the country. And great effort was made to be sure that the quality of the evaluation was high. Kathy Lord, who was a principal investigator on this study, trained the individuals at each center we evaluated their progress, how they were doing, and we shared information with them month by month to assure best practices. And to have this rapid accumulation is very gratifying. And we're trying to decide where and where will it end. This is not cheap. This whole study altogether so far has cost close to $60 million. And we hope it becomes a resource for the genetics community for years to come because there's great detail of phenotypic information, waiting for neuroimaging and genetics to take advantage of that and try and correlate the, uh, the, uh, their information with the phenotype. Just quickly, th this shows you what percentage of the families were uh, truly quads and what trios, how many girls and how many boys. You know that autism is somewhere between four and eight times more common in boys than in girls, a phenomenon that has given rise to much speculation about the role of sexual dimorphisms in the brain, and testosterone in particular. Some people think of an autistic boy as having a hyper male brain. I don't particularly buy that theory, but I'm glad to talk about it later. And, I, and, I, and without paying attention to this, uh, this is some of the demographics of the population. And what I wanted to point out is that the IQ is fairly high on the average. It's above 80. These children are able, and we almost did this intentionally in that we wanted to look at autism relatively uncomplicated by intellectual disability. We want to be sure that the genes we're looking at may have an impact on the social cognition of the individuals. So while there's a spectrum of children in the, in the study, it's on the high end. I'll um, just mention quickly, we're beginning another study where we are just focusing on one lesion. And we're beginning with that deletion on chromosome 16. And we want to collect several hundred individuals with that particular genetic lesion and then study them in great detail, about how their behavior, the neuroimaging, and other aspects of their genetics and physiology. It's a little bit the reverse of trying to phenotype people and then study their genetics. It's picking people with one genotype and following them wherever the, that leads us. And we think this will complement the original study. Now, beyond the copy number variants, there are several interesting gene candidates. And I'll just run through a couple with you now. One of the reasons for my optimism 
Uh, if you look at our website, you will see, you'll be able to click on any one of these chromosomes, and that will lead you directly to a particular gene. This one is neuroligin 3, which I will comment on later in the talk. And you can immediately get to the reference that's definitive and to um, any others that are relevant. We think this will be a great resource for people interested in autism research. Now, we've also brought in a group of investigators who are trying to evaluate each reported gene by a list of criteria. And I won't go through them, but they we're trying to rank these genes as high probability, strong, suggestive, further evidence required, and hypothesized. So far, there are 233 reported autism genetic risk factors on the web. But as this gets further developed, and we hope the community of scientists will comment and contribute to this discussion on the website, there are really only about six related to what I call idiopathic autism that are strong candidates. And there are probably another seven candidates which are called syndromic autism candidates. That is, these are, these are genes known to cause another disorder, which have autism, autistic features as a part of it, such as the fragile X syndrome that Mark Baer here works on, the uh, Rett syndrome gene that Rudy Anish has done a lot of work on, and, and several others. Here are some of my list of top candidates, the idiopathic and in the syndromic. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of why I'm hopeful about moving forward. First involves mice, and I, everybody has to have a movie of mice, so I'm going to show you a movie of a mouse, and a, and a really remarkable movie uh, of a mouse that was bearing the, it wasn't the, the uh, Rett syndrome gene, but that gene had been blocked from functioning, and then the, uh, the gene was unblocked. And it's going to offer the hope of recovery from a developmental disorder in the adult state. Another experiment I think Rudy Yanish has done, but I, I've chosen to focus on an experiment done in England by Adrian Byrd. First, you should know that this gene that causes Rett syndrome is complicated. There have been about 80 different mutations found in this gene. It is the gene responsible for Rett syndrome. 96% of individuals with RETS have a mutation in this gene. But I want you to appreciate the complexity and the challenge that's faced next. Which one of these mutations would you study? Which one will lead us to the best understanding of a mechanism of how the gene is working? Well, here's what Adrian Byrd did and his colleagues. They put what's called a stop signal in front of the gene. And in front of the stop signal, they put an, a, a cassette that could cut out that stop signal. So the mouse grew up without a functional MECP2 gene. And when he was a, she or he was an adult, that gene was cut out. And here you see on the left a mouse without a functional MECP2 gene, and one on the right with a functional gene. Now, this mouse does not exhibit the kind of social behavior you would expect of a Rett syndrome child, but my view is you take what the mouse gives you. If you know this gene is causative in the human population, then you study it in the mouse and try and understand what the mouse has done with that gene, hoping for clues in the, in the human population. Now here is the mouse with, without the functional RET gene, MECP2. It's kind of immobile. It's not going anywhere. You could say, if, I'm sure if another mouse was in that cage, he would ignore it, asocial. But it certainly is, has a motor deficit. It's not moving. And the mouse is obese, which points to a certain area of the brain. And when picked up, the mouse 
does not spread its legs. If you can see that mouse is hugging his legs in close. This is the same mouse posing after that gene had been restored, after the stop codon was removed, only two weeks later. And in terms of mouse life, even that's a short time. So the mouse is curious, is exploring, certainly would uh, approach other mice in the cage, and seems quite vigorous and has lost weight. And all this is due to the fact of cutting out the stop signal in front of the MECP2 gene. And when this mouse is picked up, as he will be any moment, <laughs> you can see his rear legs are splayed. And this is the normal reflex in a mouse, which is quite disturbed in the red mouse. So that needs to be understood. The motor systems need to be understood, the immobility and the indifference to the environment. And it's a very important clue. I do want to say a word about Fragile X syndrome, since I believe this is the best inroad to therapy of this class of developmental disorders that we have. And a lot of that, again, is due to the work in Mark Baer's lab. Fragile X encodes a, encodes a protein that uh, influences messenger RNAs out near synapses, the, the contacts between nerve cells that uh, Bob talked about. And when Fragile X is, is broken, when it's mutant, the, the formation of these proteins is, goes on out of control. And many of these proteins have deleterious effects. There are a couple of double negatives in here, so stick with it if you can. What Mark had discovered, working in an entirely different area, is that a certain surface membrane receptor, a receptor for glutamate, actually could interact with the FMRP mechanism, with the fragile X protein mechanism. And it could turn down the synthesis of the same proteins that were turned up in Fragile X's absence. So he and now many other people have begun looking for ways in the absence of FMRP to block the action of this glutamate receptor called the metabotropic glutamate receptor. And I think the first reported results are that in selected populations, this may be an effective therapy, an antagonist to a glutamate receptor to treat a disorder which was previously, and I say previously, meaning the last two years, thought to be untreatable. And I find that a hopeful sign. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark and others have shown that this uncontrolled mRNA translation affects synapses by causing the turnover of chemoreceptors and by eventually causing the uh, elongation and abnormal function of the contacts between the, the receiving cell and the incoming excitatory input called dendritic spines. I was amused to find an old reference to similar work. This is work done in 1974 by Dominic Purpura, who was studying mental retardation at Albert Einstein. And he drew these pictures from stained neurons. And he remarked that these spines, these extensions from the dendritic shafts of neurons looked abnormal. They looked too long and thin, and they were sparse compared to uh, the dendrites from individuals who were normally functioning. So I think this is an important clue that there is a destruction of the receiving surface for excitatory input. Certainly, this would affect the excitatory inhibitory balance that Bob talked about. Now, I do, in the beautiful pictures, I have the same pictures, actually, that Bob showed you of the synapse. We are now beginning to realize that the synapse is a complex molecular machine. And this picture, which you've seen once today, from an article by Morgan Shang, a former member of the uh, Department of Brain and Cognitive Science and the Pickhauer Institute here, shows you the work of several investigators 
that reveal the, the beginning. It's certainly much more, this, this is now six years old. I'm sure there are twice as many new protein molecules, new gene products at this synapse. And the striking thing is that many of them have been implicated as autism genetic risk factors. And it will take a tremendous effort to sort out which ones are relevant, which ones act sooner, which ones later, and which ones bear on the function of neural circuits. Now, I'm going to end by talking a bit about neural circuits, cognition, and behavior. I'm all for mice. I think they are the best experimental animal we have for finding the effects of some of the autism risk factor genes. I'm also in favor of flies and worms and frogs because they each will contribute important information. But I believe that in the next decade, we will be the prime experimental animals for studying autism. This is a uniquely human disorder. The ability to understand each other, to know what we are thinking. And in the end, we need to develop theories and models which will account for the link between genes and behavior. Not just models, but models that can be disproved in the jargon of Karl Popper. There are many, many models, too many, but we need to focus. It's not enough to say autism is a disorder of synapses or autism is a disorder of connections. Of course it is. We need more specific hypotheses about autism and how this relates to social behavior. Well, a lot of work done here, this is a, from a paper by Nancy Canwisher and Rebecca Sachs, have begun to point out regions of the brain that are particularly active in the performance of social tasks. There are many other people working in this area, and I, I don't, I don't believe they do, mean to say that this is a strict restrictive localization. These are the only areas of the brain involved in social cognition. But certainly they're pointing to regions that are particularly active in the uh, superior right temporal gyrus, the medial inside part of the hemisphere, and the inferior temporal gyrus, the fusiform gyrus, are, have been found in study after study to be affected in, in individuals who have difficulty in social interactions. This is from a meta-analysis by Uta Frith and her colleague in London, where she's looked at different things, how individuals monitor the actions of others, their own self-knowledge, their own person perception, mentalizing and outcome monitoring. And in each case, the, the medial part of the hemisphere above the anterior cingulate gyrus and the an medial frontal lobe seem to be more active. So my bet is that when we have gene candidates and circuit mechanisms, these areas will be particularly opportune to study. If, I, if my next step was to make a slice of the brain and study it in a dish, I would take a slice from one of these areas. And I think many people uh, are beginning to agree with that. I do want to mention one other phenomenon because it's so striking, even though it is a bit controversial. But it, it gets at the kind of thing we need to know about. And this is the phenomenon of mirror neurons, described by a group in Italy, but now being studied worldwide by Rizzolatti and colleagues. Now, what you're looking at here is a monkey. You don't, what you don't see is there's an electrode in the monkey's brain through a platform on his skull. And that electrode is listening to the discharge of a nerve cell. Those little vertical bars are firings of a nerve cell. It's a very focal recording uh, of one nerve cell at a time. And every time that monkey reaches for something on the table, this is one trial, a second, a third, that same nerve cell discharges. Now the amazing thing that Rizzolatti found was that when the monkey is watching someone reach for the same object, 
the very same nerve cell discharges over and over again. This is not a different nerve cell, it's the same nerve cell. So this nerve cell discharges when the monkey executes an action and when he observes an action. And Rizzolatti has gone much further than that. I don't think we have time to talk about. This is a type of understanding of the action, the neural correlate that the monkey can understand what the experimenter is doing. And I must say there's evidence from young children that there are, you can test growing up, even when they're in the early stages, three, four, five months old, that if you can convince that child to pay attention, and some children do and some don't, and, ask, and, and encourage them to reach and touch an object, that they will then smile when their parent or someone nearby reaches for that same object. But the children who do not reach, who do not pay attention, and do not themselves reach for the object, seem to ignore the people who are also reaching the object. This is a work of a uh, woman in uh, South Carolina. Now here's an example where it does apply to humans, where Rizzolatti has recorded from a muscle used for chewing. And he, what he has done is uh, ask the individual to reach for an object and either put it in their mouth. This is a, a, a normal, typically developing subject and a autistic subject. To put it in their mouth or put it in a container. Same motion, near their mouth, but put it on the shoulder next to the mouth. And of course, you can't record a single nerve cell from the brain of a human individual. So he used the discharge of these muscles as a surrogate for the outflow of the nervous system. And what you can see here in the normal subject, when that individual is reaching for an object, that muscle begins discharging, even begins discharging before the, the individual actually moves his arm. It's in anticipation. And then when that individual merely watches that, that phenomenon happen, observes the phenomenon happen, there is a bit of a discharge in those muscles. But when an autistic individual does it, there's no anticipation when that individual reaches, and there's no discharge when that individual watches another subject. So one of the frontline challenges in cognitive neuroscience, I believe, is to understand this mirror neuron system, as it's called. I think there's no question that such a system exists. The debate is its relevance to autism as a disorder. And I think we're all watching that debate closely. So I'm gonna close with just talking in general terms about uh, the value of studying a disorder that affects interpersonal interactions and the value of the scientific method and why patent laureate I think this institute is so important. These are the values I've always associated with science and with interacting with colleagues of objectivity, sharing, democracy, human education and the ethical conduct of research. And I believe the McGovern Institute will be in the forefront of these areas. It should be and it will be and it, and it will be one of the leaders in the MIT community. One of the examples I love to cite is this paper. One of the early, it's the first paper by Huda Zogby who identified the RET gene uh, as being the same as the MECP2 gene. The reason I like this is several fold. One, the first, uh, one you have to realize Huda Zogby herself is an immigrant from Lebanon. Went to medical school in this country spent several years during the Israeli-Lebanese, first Israel-Lebanese war, living in a bath, not several years, sorry, one full year, living in the bathroom at the American University of Beirut because it was too dangerous to go home from the university to her home. And the remarkable thing is the first, when she got to Baylor, she hooked up with a young Israeli scientist, Ruthie Amir, and taught that woman science and has followed her career, has remained close friends since this time. 
after Amir has re-emigrated back to uh, Israel. Now, if that can happen between individuals, it should be able to happen on a larger scale. The other thing I would like to point out in this is that uh, five of these six authors are women. And this paper was submitted on a certain date and accepted six days later. So that's not a bad role model to follow. Second point, which I get emotional about, is that we, although we are talking a lot about translational research, and I have become a strong advocate for this, about the need to apply our results, you can never forget how these results originate in disinterested, curiosity-driven research. And there are few places on this globe as good as MIT to promote both. This, the, the, the neuroligand story, which has led to two convincing autism risk factors, and through the neuroligands to, to about six or seven others, including the shanks, began with a black widow spider, with an individual, Tom Sudoff, studying the venom of this spider. Because this venom caused the outpouring of neurotransmitter from synaptic terminals. He didn't know anything about autism at the time. It was about 15 or 20 years ago when he began this work. But subsequently, he isolated this venom, the principle in the venom. He isolated the receptor for it, which turned out to be norexin. And he isolated the partner for norexin, which turned out to be neuroligin. And so subsequently, a tremendous amount has been done on the genetics, the protein chemistry, and the physical chemistry. And it turns out that neuroligin and norexin are binding partners. And I believe these molecules, along with Shank and a few others, will lead us to a much more coherent picture of synapses and hence circuits that are not functioning quite right in autism. So as Cajal said, as he, he always said something brilliant, Ramoni e. Cajal, people with little understanding fail to observe the mysterious threads that bind the clinic to the laboratory, just as the stream is connected with the source. So Laurie and Pat, I wish you, and I would love to be part of the next decade of success in doing this and linking these things together. Thanks.